as raiser of judgment. Now, son of man, take a sharp sword and use it as a barber's razor to shave your head and your beard. Then take a set of scales and divide up the hair. When the days of your siege come to an end, burn a third of the hair inside the city. Take a third and strike it with the sword all around the city. And scatter a third to the wind, for I will pursue them with the drawn sword. But take a few hairs and tuck them away in the folds of your garment. Again, take a few of these and throw them into the fire and burn them. A fire will spread from there to all Israel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I want to spend a little time with uh, Ezekiel. I'm not going to bore you too much. Well, you know, if you're not in my Bible study class, then, um, if you, then you won't be too bored. But if you're in my Bible study class, you already know some of the answers to this. But anyway, so we're going to talk a little bit about Ezekiel, but not for uh, just for a short period of time. Anyways, Ezekiel is a prophet called by God. Um, he was actually uh, training to be a priest when he was 25 years old in the land of Judah. And his, because his father was a priest, so that was just the way uh, it goes, that, you know, it, it follows along the bloodline. So Ezekiel was um, a very young man when he was called by God to prophesy. And uh, at the time, he was about 30 years old. Uh, when he was doing, I know that we always look at our prophets as being, you know, very old and wise and, you know, having the gray hair and the long white beard. But that wasn't the case with Ezekiel. Ezekiel was actually uh, very young uh, when he was prophesizing. But anyway, so he's there and he's uh, trying to tell the people and warn them about all the things that they're doing wrong. All the uh, idol worship that they're doing, all the polytheism. And when they, uh, in this culture, when they, as they are worshiping uh, multiple gods, the problem was is that they were actually uh, lighting up their children and throwing it and sacrificing them. Uh, they did uh, child sacrifices at the time when they uh, worshiped these multiple gods. So that was part of the thing that uh, was the problem. And also, too, these gods were not living, right? We serve a living God because we know that our God, our Jesus, resurrected from the th on the third day. And we know that we serve a living God. And the problem is, is that uh, the Israelites were starting to worship all these gods. And God classified uh, Jerusalem as the center of it all. The ones that were the higher uh, archy or the elite to be able to promote monotheism, which is worshiping one God, promoting the, pr promoting the living God. And that was the problem. The problem was is they were supposed to roll out for God and be able to spread salvation. And that's not what they were doing. So God was very, very upset. And so by doing this, he told Ezekiel to shave his head, which was very humiliating to a priest because it was against the law in Leviticus that you didn't shave your head. It was very humiliating uh, to Ezekiel, but that's what God told him to do. So that's what he did. And he knew that the people would know that he meant business when he shaved his head and shaved his beard. Now, a third of it, he said, a third of his hairs would go uh, to... Uh, you know, to be burned, and a third of his hairs would be by the sword. He would cut it by the sword and spread it around Jerusalem. Um, and then um, a third of it would be scattered to the wind. He'd scan, scan, so he's burning his hair, he's cutting his hair with the sword, and then he's scattering the hair to the wind. But then the Lord said, so, you know, take some of your hair, a few strands, and put it in your robe. So, uh, what do you think that the hairs mean? What are they? What, what are the hairs? Without my Bible study, people, even if you're our Bible study, do you remember what the hairs are? That's right. That's right. The Israelites. Uh, the hairs is people. 
That's what it is. Hairs equals people. And so that's what God was saying. God was uh, telling Ezekiel to demonstrate what, the, what was going to happen to the people. So a third of the people were going to die by famine and disease, pandemic, virus, plague. You know, a third of the people were going to die by the sword. And a third of the people were going to be dispersed. They were going to uh, scatter out. You know, they were going to be captive into Babylon. They were going to go into Egypt. They were going to scatter into uh, Rome, Italy. They were going to scatter into Syria. All these places, he said. But then he said, put a few people into your row. Why? Why? What, what, was so, what, what were these people? What was so special about these people being put into his row? Exactly, the followers, the faithful, exactly. Those were the followers. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Eden. Those were the followers, exactly. Those were the faithful people that he told God to put in his robe. But then he said, take some strands out and burn them. Why? You got the faithful people, so why would God say, take some of these strands out and burn them? Fake. Yes. And so we got scripture to point that out. So in your scripture today, uh, reading, you're going to see when Jesus was arrested in the garden. And I'm going to give you an interpretation of a false prophet. In verse 47, it says this. While he was still speaking, Judas, Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. A large mob with swords and clubs was with him from the chief priests and elders of the people. His betrayer had given them a sign. The one I kiss, he's the one, arrest him. So he went right up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Those are the ones that God said that he was going to take out, told Ezekiel to take out of his robe and burn them because those were the false prophets. Those were the ones that wear their Sunday clothes and then go back to the bar on Monday, right? Those are the ones that wear their Sunday clothes and go ahead and every other word is the F word, right? Or GD or GC or whatever else, right? Those are the false prophets. Those are the ones who uh, were able to uh, transform or be willing to transform because Judas was the chosen 12. He was part of the chosen 12 of the disciples. And then what do you know? He's a betrayer. He's a false prophet. And God and Jesus, well, Jesus warns us about our false prophets, to be wary of false prophets, to be wary of people who proclaim Jesus Christ, but yet walk away with the same life, right? How would you feel, you know, me being at the pulpit and giving you the sermon and, and telling you about false prophets, and then I go off and kill somebody? How would you feel if I go off and start abusing children? How would you feel if I went off and, uh, I speed, I'm sorry, I can't use that one. So, uh, how would you feel, you know, if I went off and started, uh, uh, drinking profusely in a bar? This is what I mean. When we transform, when we transform, we change our lives for Jesus Christ. And the problem is, is that Judas was with Jesus Christ. Judas ate with Jesus. He slept with Jesus. He prayed with Jesus. He, he did all these things. You would think that he would not be a betrayer, but he was. Because why? What didn't change? His heart. His heart. His heart. The inside of him did not change and became a betrayer. And I want to tell you a story. I can tell you all this theological stuff that's in the Bible that has to do with Judas and, and the garden. And I can tell you the history and, and all this stuff about Ezekiel. But you know what? you got to come to my Bible study because we are doing an in-depth study of Ezekiel. And it's been really great, right? Uh, Eden and Seal and uh, Denise, you, they all come to my Bible study. Sally, uh, so come to my Bible study. Uh, it's really, really good. We have a great time uh, uh, together. That's my plug. But I want to tell you uh, something that's really, really cool about the faithful. I told you last week that Angela uh, 
Pastor Eddie, the Lady Rose's daughter, was uh, suffering from ovarian core cancer. She actually came out uh, when we joined together in Waterport as a church. Uh, when we went out there together, she actually came out of the van. Uh, we didn't know if she was going to come out of the van because she was very, very sick from the chemo treatments. And so she, she loved to sing. She loved to praise God. She was very, very strong in her faith. And she took that, she just started singing. I don't even think that she had a mic, did she? She just started just belting it out, just singing with her cane. And she's going slowly down, you know. Uh, she's 37 years old. She's got this cane because she's really, really tired and sick from all the treatments. And she sits down and she just starts belting out, victory in Jesus. She belts out all this, all this praise to God. And so, you know, uh, through her treatments, she just praised God, praised God, praised God. And she praised God for the tubes coming out of her body. She praised God for the healing. She praised God uh, for everything. And so she started getting well. And they t I told you that they took her out of hospice, right? But then she said to her parents, because her parents were taking care of her and they had uh, people coming in, but she she said to her parents after she was taken off hospice that she uh, was ready, that she was ready to go home. She was ready to go home, and uh, they um, they didn't really connect that for some reason. They didn't uh, connect that she was ready to go home. So she was praising her way through, and when I seen her a couple weeks ago, I was able to uh, pray with her and, and, and continue on that praising of God and to praise, praise our way through it and that, you know, you have a purpose until you take your last breath. Monday morning, uh, she uh, asked her mom and dad if she could have some grits. So they made her some grits and uh, they brought it to her. Uh, she took two bites. Gone. The Lord took her. The Lord took her home on Monday at 9.50 a.m. while she was still praising Jesus. And the Lord took her as quick as a second. As soon as she took those two bites, she took her last breath. But the thing is, is that her funeral was yesterday and let me tell you, church, that was the best funeral I've ever went to. Let me tell you about the praise and worship that they had. We were dancing in our pews. Mom and dad were dancing because Angela, that's what she wanted. She wanted church. And she got church. And her whole family had the band up there. And Preachers from everywhere were there and proclaiming God and just giving God the glory because she praised God all the way through her illness. And it was so great because her children went up there and said, you know what? She goes, they, uh, her daughter said, she'll, Mom will always be in my heart. Mom will always be by my side. Praising Jesus. We're going to remember the hallelujahs. Uh, her son went up there and said, you know what, Mama always said, uh, I always remember Mama's talks, our late night talks, and I always remember when, when I got kind of, you know, out of the sorts, and she used to say, you better take that bass out of my voice, you better take that bass out of your voice, is what she would say to him. And she said, you know what, Mama, Mama wouldn't want any of you sad or crying. She wants you to be smiling because she wants to have church, and we're having church. And so he goes, if you've never been to church, welcome to church, because we're having it now. And let me tell you, that was the best worship service I could have been a part of with their family, worshiping and praising God. And the thing about Angela is that she was so impactful to people about her faith and how she stood steadfast in her faith that her, uh, her doctor, her oncology doctor, was at her funeral and he said that the impact that she had on his life about her faith will stay with him for the rest of his life. 
And he went on to describe how her faith was, even when she was the sickest of sick during her chemo treatments. When she was the sickest of sick, she was still praising God. Her parents were still praising God. Her children were still praising God. And it affected, she affected and impacted an oncology doctor so much that he was willing to come to the service, that he wanted to, to explain how Angela impacted his life and that he would hold on to it for the rest of his life. The city of Rochester gave the family a plaque. The mayor signed a declaration of how much Angela was a great impact on the city of Rochester because of her faith, because of her steadfast, her steadfastness. She was uh, strong, and she impacted the city of Rochester so much with her faith, with her God, with her praising and worship that the mayor was moved enough to sign a plaque and a declaration to her, her children, and her family. Church, that's what the faithful looks like. That's what the faithful looks like. When we're able to praise God no matter what, when we praise God through the storms, we praise God through bad weather, we praise God through grief, we praise God through pain, we praise God when we're broke, we praise God when we got a little bit of money, we praise God when we got a little bit of candy, right? Chocolate networks, right? Coffee. We praise God when we run out of coffee. We praise God when we don't have any candy. We praise God when we don't have any pain, no matter what, we praise God. Because that's what the faithful does. The faithful praises God. And we hold steadfast because when we just do a little bit and stay in steadfast, when we have problems in our life, when we still praise God instead of, instead of uh, complaining to God and, and yelling at God and, and saying, why, 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 why me, Lord? Why do you do this to me? No. We praise God because you know why. Do you know who's watching? All the oncology doctors were watching Angela. All the nurses were watching Angela. That whole hospital was watching Angela and her family. That whole city of Rochester was watching her family. And just a little bit of faith of a mustard seed. Look how many people she impacted. And that's why we were singing and dancing. Because that's what she wanted. She wanted church. That's the faithful. And that's what it looks like. The pastor talked about a changing room. That we should go in a changing room. That we should take the world off and go in our changing room. And then come back out transformed. To be able to be faithful and, and have that boldness. And, and have that spiritual growth. And I commend you. I commend you at being the faithful. I commend you for anything that you do for the church. I commend you for coming to Bible study to want to grow in your spiritual faith. I commend you for wanting to be a part of our truck or treat and giving Christ. I commend you for wanting to emerge from covenant and, and so you can spiritually grow. I commend you for that. I commend you for anything you do in the name of God. I commend you for the time that you take to come and worship your Lord and Savior here in this church. Because you are the faithful. Every single one of you are in the robe of Ezekiel, including me. We are the faithful. So I pray, I pray that you all walk out of here like Judas. I pray that you go in that changing room, as the minister said yesterday during the service, and you come out transformed. Because it's a bunch of confusion when you worship multiple gods and they're not alive. Jesus is not comparable to Muhammad. Why is that? What did Jesus do? He rose. He rose. Jesus rose 
from the dead. Muhammad didn't do that, but Jesus did. And that's what I want to convey to you. Be the faithful. Don't act like the faithful. Don't pretend to be the faithful. Be the faithful. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
The question this week that I want you to ask yourself is this. Do I surrender all? Do I surrender all? Is what you uh, should be your prayer this week. I'm challenging you to ask that question of yourself uh, because uh, we do want to surrender all. We don't want to be a traitor. So I hope that you surrender all and not betray like Judas did to Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and be the faithful. Thank you.